Welcome everyone to our excursion today. I am Sarah Falkowski. I'm the education coordinator at Rookery Bay in Naples, Florida. And I am here to welcome you to our webinar. This will be recorded and the link will be shared just after we finish the program today. We also um, want to invite you to ask questions of our special guests today by entering them into the chat box or the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So a little bit about who we are and what we do here at Rookery Bay. So like I mentioned, I'm Sarah. Today you're going to join the rest of the education team and part of the research team as we live stream from a mist net at the Environmental Learning Center. We are part of a national network. The National Estuarine Research Reserve System protects 30 ecologically sensitive areas in 24 states and Puerto Rico. And two more states might be joining the national network with their own reserves soon. Each of these reserves is designed to protect and study estuarine systems through research, stewardship, and education. Here in Florida, we are part of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, and our Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection manages a whole lot of land. You can see all of these sites around the state, and maybe you're even tuning in from one of those areas. And here at Rookery Bay, we manage 110,000 acres. So today we are located right here at the STAR. This is the Environmental Learning Center, and we are open Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with a special event this Saturday where you can participate in a banding experience like we're about to show you today. So I'm gonna to go to the field cam and see what is happening out there at our net. Field cam, are you ready? Hello, Sarah, we are, can you hear and see us okay? Yep, I'm just gonna spotlight your video. Okay, there we are, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second excursion that we're doing through the Festival of Birds all throughout January. My name is Morgan. I'm on the education team here at Rookery Bay, and I'm joined by our in-house avian specialist from the research team, Cole. Again, introduce yourself to our people. Good morning, I'm Cole. I am the avian specialist here at Rookery Bay, and I'm the on-site bander. Woo, okay, so I think you gave us a little tidbit on what we're gonna be talking about today. So this excursion is focusing all on bird banding. Okay, so Cole, what exactly is bird banding and why is it important in your line of work? That's a great question. So bird banding is a method used by scientists to keep track of an individual bird. So many birds will look exactly like the other birds of their species. If you see one black skimmer, it looks like another black skimmer. But we want to know about the individual. And in order to do that, we have to mark that individual with a specific number or code that tells us who we're looking at. And in order to do that, we've used bird bands. And this is a method that's been in use for over a hundred years. Whoa, man, that sounds intense. Can anybody go out and do this? Can anyone band a bird? No, no, bird banding takes a lot of permits. And in order to gain the permit, permits, you have to have spent a lot of time shadowing and volunteering with other bird banders to really learn this stuff. It's still very much a passed down um, skill. Gotcha. So like Sarah mentioned, uh, this Saturday, if you're looking to get a little bit of insight as to how this process goes in person, uh, Cole will be here this Saturday doing it. So great opportunity just to shadow, get you know, a little bit of a feel of how this goes. Yeah, and in order to learn this stuff, you do have to volunteer at a lot of banding stations. And a lot of banding stations that you can find around the state and around the country do accept volunteers. And those volunteers can work their way up to becoming a bander themselves. Wow, so lots of opportunities to learn. But today, I want to learn more. Uh, so, Cole, well, what materials and methods are you using to catch these birds during the banding process? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's really difficult for you to see here. Our education team is going to help us out. We are actually standing in front of a mist net. So a mist net is so named because it looks like mist and it is so hard to see. So what you're seeing here at Morgan's hand 
is the netting. And then this line here is called a trammel line. And the trammel line is what allows these birds to hit this net and get caught in the pocket. Can you kind of take it down a little bit? So this is a beanie baby. He's going to be a little heavier than any bird that hits this net. So it causes it to sink. But you can see how it's just hanging here in this netting. Wow. If a real bird were to fly in, it would just kind of hit that. They kind of swing around a little bit and it causes them to get tangled. And then they just hang there until a biologist comes in a very short period of time to get them out. Wow, so we just saw you extract a stuffed bird, our beanie baby here. Um, but like you said, you started to go into it a little bit. If a bird that was real wants to be caught in this net, is it usually difficult to remove? How does that go? Yeah, it can be difficult, but most of the time, the banders are able to get them out very quickly. And this is part of why banders need to be practicing other under other people who know how to do it so that you can get good at this so it happens fast and seamlessly. We do have a video that we can play today showing what extracting a bird looks like since we don't have a bird in our net right now. Okay, Cole, first I'm going to show this picture of the mist net. So this net is a, a still picture, obviously not taken in our mangrove forest but it can show um, those lines like Cole was talking about. So next I'm gonna show you this cool video that Cole made for us. We just recorded recently, just in case we didn't catch a live bird today. And we wanted to be able to show you how is it that we remove birds from the net. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit play and enjoy this little clip. See, that was pretty simple. We caught a cardinal and Cole was able to successfully remove it from the net very undramatically. No one was injured. It wasn't scary and safely secure it in this homemade pillowcase bag. So now the field cam is actually moving to another location where they're going to show you a little bit more about what we do with the birds once they're removed from the net. So they'll be joining us momentarily. I'll just send out a reminder to you all that if you have a question, we'd love for you to enter it into the chat box or the Q&A box, because we want to know the questions you have for our experts. All right. Thank you, Sarah, for showing that video. So uh, my name is Janine. I'm part of the education team here. I'm joining Morgan and Cole, and uh, we've moved locations. We're now uh, with all this amazing equipment. And uh, we're gonna figure out, you know, what exactly that banding process looks like and all the different tools, uh, equipment that kind of come into play as you're deciding what band to use, where to band, um, based on maybe what bird you have. So cool. Yeah, what have you brought to show us today? Yeah, so the first thing that we need to do when we catch a bird is determine what species we're working with. And most of the time the bander will know, but in case they don't know, which is possible because there are hundreds of species of birds in the United States, there is a book. We call this the Bander's Bible, but it is actually called the Pile Guide. And this book gives us information about every species that we can capture here. And it tells us what size they are, how to tell what if they're a male or a female, how to tell if they're a first year or an older bird. That's all in here. Um, I keep a lot of that information in my own little cheat sheet. So we've got this guy here too. 
so that I don't have to spend so much time looking through that book for every individual bird. So once you have determined your bird, then you've got to decide what size that bird is going to be. So you can take it back to our little, I'm actually not sure what this is. We've decided, I think it's a kiwi, um, but he has legs. And in order to tell, the book will guide you um, as to what band size it thinks you should put on it, but you can also use a measuring tool. And this actually you slide it around the bird's leg and it can tell you what size band to use on each uh, individual bird. So we do have a large range of bird, of bird bands. I'm going to use Janine here. So this is what a bird band looks like. It has a nine digit code on it. And each nine digit code is unique to that individual bird. So no two birds will have the same code. In order to read this, you need to get all nine digits off of it. So it can be kind of hard to do in the field, um, especially if you've got a smaller bird. Woo. So this is called a 0A band. It is the smallest band we use here at Rookery Bay. This goes on your tiny little warblers. Um, the only thing smaller than that is hummingbird bands. And in order to band a hummingbird, you actually have to have a series of other permits that I don't hold. So we don't do that here. This is the smallest one we've got. <laughs> That's incredible. They're very cool. And I see you have actually several sizes back there. So yeah. So here we range through the size zero A to a size four. And the size four would be for a bird like a pileated woodpecker. Awesome. And um, so do we have a live bird today that we're able to show this or, you know, how long does this process take when you're actually going to put the band on? Yeah. It can take differing times depending on the species of bird and the familiarity with that bird. But you wanna get that bird out of the net and processed and back on its way as quickly as possible. So it is a fairly quick process. Unfortunately, the best time of day to catch these birds is right at dawn. And um, it is 11-ish here. So we unfortunately do not have a bird to work on, but we kind of anticipated this and back in September during migration season, we filmed a bird banding. Sarah, would you wanna put that on? You bet. So we have, um, I'm sorry, there we are. Here is our full banding walkthrough video. Now this one's a little bit longer and this is Cole also in the parking lot where we will be on Saturday and she is narrating what we do once the bird comes out of the little bag. So let me go ahead and hit play. So this guy right here, this is a warbler. It is called an oven bird. One of the most distinctive features of an oven bird is this nice little head streaks and they're very orange in the middle there. So these guys have, um, a fairly small leg. We've got a bunch of different bands, all of which have different sizes on them. So the sizes can range from, this would be a size two, that's a blue jay type band, or this one, which is going to be a size one. Each band has a unique set of numbers on it. So this guy is going to be 808. There's a nine digit number there, but I'm not going to read it off right now. So we put this band on their leg. There is a, um, there's been studies done showing how much weight a bird can carry. And it's like 0.4% of their body weight. This is very, very negligible. So they'll never even feel it. Um, they might spend 
a little bit of today looking at their leg like what happened but they won't feel it so that's this little band we make sure that it's all the way closed so there's no gap because if there was a gap it could snag on something and could cause this bird to get hung up but we made sure there was no uh, gap so now we take some morphometric data so the morphometric data tells us about the health of the bird. This is a wing cord ruler. When we take the wing cord, we go like this, and we don't push down on this wing at all. It's a bent wing number, and that is going to be 73. And we put that on our data sheet. So this last time we banded, we got an oven bird, and it was 75. So this is about right for the wing cord. Then we check the weight of the bird, um, which we will do on a scale, but there's also different pockets of fat on a bird's body. This is not gonna show up that well on uh, the camera, but this bone here, that's the clavicle. And when you blow on the bird's feathers, the feathers actually part way so you can see into the clavicle and that's where they store a lot of their fat. So I'm gonna do that. So unfortunately, this guy's clavicle is empty, meaning that it has zero fat. Now that's pretty standard this time of year because they're migrating. And when they migrate, they burn all their fat. And then they land in places like Rookery Bay and they eat all the berries and the bugs that they can get a hold of to replace that fat that they burned on their migration route. Um, so we also look at whether these are male or female. This particular species, you cannot tell if it's male or female. The male and the female look exactly the same. So that makes this guy an unknown. That goes on there as well. You can tell the age. Um, that is very complicated, but it involves looking at the feathers on the wings and the different uh, ages will have different feather, um, different feather patterns. So this is looking to me like an adult. Yeah. So this is going to be an adult bird, which we call an after hatch year bird. Um, and we did that by plumage. Most of the oven birds we've caught this fall have been hatchier, so this guy's doing pretty well. So then, right before we let him go, we put him, first I have to do what's called tearing. This is to tell the weight of the bag, because I'm gonna put him in the bag, and then I'm gonna put the bag on the scale, and that's gonna tell us how much this bird weighs, but if I didn't, tear it then it would also tell us how much the bag weighs which is going to be considerably more than the bird so we've got them in the bag make sure the whole bag including the strap are on the scale and its weight is going to be 17.8 and now this bird is good to go so Normally we just let them go right away. There's two different grips that banders use when they're banding birds. There is the banders grip. This is how we control their wings and their neck and head to make sure that we can look at all the different parts of the body. Now there's also what's called the photographer's grip. And we do this if we get a bird that we want to get a picture of for some reason, whether it is a rare bird or a bird with uh, a different type of marking on it. So that's your photographer's grip and that's your oven bird. Oh that was very cute. So now we're gonna let them go. I'm gonna let them right back in. These birds like thickets so we're headed towards that thicket over there. Oop. And he's off. So we also record 
how well they do after their capture. So this guy is going to get a 300, meaning he did just well. He flew off like nothing ever happened. So that's what we're doing out here. Um, while I'm banding this other oven bird, I wanted to kind of show you the photographic guide. This is called the warbler guide. And this can kind of help a bander through the process of a bird that they might not know very well. We get a lot of oven birds here, so I didn't really need this book today, but on certain birds we might get something that is really unique or something I've never caught in a net before. And I can use the banders or the warbler guide mixed with what is called the pile guide. Pile guide has all the information. This tells you what the bird looks like, what time of year it looks certain ways, where to look for the aging and the sexing of the bird. And it's got this one. It's a multi-part book, but this one has all the passerines. So that's kind of what we're doing out here. Um, thanks for joining us. Okay, what a great recording. I'm glad that we did that ahead of time, <laughs> just in case we didn't catch a live bird today. If you do join us on Saturday morning, I'm sure that we will have birds because we're going to set the nets out earlier. This is uh, sort of um, later in the day, like we were mentioning. So, okay, field cam, are you guys back at it? Yeah, we are. That was really a great video. I liked how we got to see you working with all the tools that you just showed us and the, the bird Bible, the banding Bible. Um, so yeah, really see how everything interacts and definitely makes sense that you would need a lot of experience if this is uh, something you're going to do on a regular basis and handle these uh, sensitive creatures. So uh, yeah, I'm glad we were able to capture that. And, uh, you know, this kind of led me to think, well, what if I'm out birding? Well, and, you know, I'm spying a, a bird, I'm trying to identify it, but I do notice a band. Am I going to be able to read that band? Are there other bands that are field readable? Is that the right yeah. term? Yeah, that's the exact right term. So the little metal bands that we're putting on come from the USGS bird banding lab, and that's what has that nine digit number on it. That is going to be very hard to read in the field, especially on small birds. Now on a bigger bird like a pelican, you might be able to do it if you've got a camera, but there are different bands that we call field readable bands. I'm going to give that to you. These bands have a shorter code and a color that goes with it. So this is actually a brown pelican band. Um, this code would be blue with white letters and it would be AP zero or O. Um, and if you see this band on a bird, a lot of times you can get a picture of it or at least you can get that information, what color and what the band says. And then you can help and report these to reportbands.gov. And they'll actually not only send that information to the person who banded the bird, but they'll actually send you a little certificate that says, congratulations with your name on it. This bird was banded on this day by this person in this location. So you can really get involved with the science behind the bird banding by reporting these bands if you see them. Good species around here to look for would be the pelicans or the black skimmers. A lot of them are banded. That's amazing. Yeah, that one I feel like is definitely more noticeable than those little silver bands that we were showing earlier. And, uh, you know, we were focusing on the songbirds for this type of, uh, for this method with the mist net. Do you actually band any other birds throughout the season? Um, is there other alternative methods to tracking birds? Yeah. So there's a lot of different people doing different projects all over the place and at different times. So here at Rookery Bay, we're focusing on migrating songbirds. So our key times are the spring and the fall, but there's other projects going on looking at things like our black skimmers on our beaches that we're really focused on who's breeding there 
who's going, where they're going, and if they're successful. And we can even band a juvenile of somebody who has a band and we can see their family lineage as well. That's amazing. And these bands kind of, if people are looking out for them, you can see where the birds are going on their migration. And even if a bird that was banded here as a chick might be band, uh, nestings on some rooftop in Tampa. So they're going all over the place. And this is the only real way to track them. That is so cool. Um, and I think we have maybe time for one more uh, little tool that we want to share and kind of tell you in advance about our next excursion. So what do you have there? Yeah, so what we've got here, and I'm gonna give this to you because it can be really hard to see. This is actually a radio tag. So this goes for the MODIS wildlife tracking system. And what happens with these is they actually get attached to the back of a small songbird and they're pinging, they're making little noises that of course we can't hear and the birds can't hear, but radio antennas can pick up on. And there's a unique ping to each one that allows us to know who the bird is and what area they're moving in. So you can actually track their migration. Our next uh, excursion is totally based on the MODIS wildlife tracking system and how these work and the birds that are moving through Rookery Bay on their migration. Just picked up by those tiny little antennas that Janine showed you. Awesome, I'm really looking forward to learning more about that particular uh, way of tracking and you should all join us. Um, so Sarah will give the dates for that as we end uh, with you all today. But we do have one more special guest that we wanna introduce and um, she actually was out on a field trip this morning for Festival of Birds. So. Without further ado, Rochelle, come on in and introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. I'm Rochelle um, with Florida Audubon. You guys may have seen me on a couple of the field trips, including if you were out this morning at Tiger Tail Lagoon. We had four of you out there with us today. We saw a good amount of our normal herons and egrets. We even spotted a green heron, which is really tricky to find because they're just so much smaller. That's amazing. And we had brown pelicans and the American white pelicans foraging right next to each other. So we got to see them side by side and talk about how you can differentiate between the two types of pelicans we have down here in wow. Southwest Florida. White pelican and brown pelican. <laughs> That's the best. That's a pretty good spot to go birding, right? Yeah, it's a great spot to go birding. You get a lot of different types of birds. You'll get your wading birds there, you get your shorebirds there, and then your seabirds there. So it's a good spot to see everything that we've got down here in Florida that's really special and unique to us. Perfect. And do you have another trip coming up? Is there something else you're involved with? Yep, I've got more field trips coming up. I think my next one is on uh, Thursday. I'll be out at Clam Pass, which is a good spot to actually see what Paul was talking about. Those blanded black skimmers are often at Clam Pass Park. So I'll be out there with my scope and we can get some scope views on them. And you can actually see what it looks like to see those bands out in the wild and in the field. Um, so I'll be doing that. And we also have a bird banding workshop coming up on Monday. Will we be going through how to ID different types of shorebirds waiting birds and seabirds. So if you're out there and you struggle to figure out what am I looking at, that's the class for you and you should definitely sign up. <laughs> I need to go to that too. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for popping in and saying hi. Um, she's been helping out here, checking uh, if we've had any, you know, unexpected visitors to our MISNET. But uh, with that, we are going to send it back to Sarah um, to talk a little bit more about those dates and show you a nice flyer. And then we'll get ready for questions. Thank you guys. Okay, so now um, I want everyone to drop your questions in the chat box so our team can prepare. Um, I just want to mention that it is the Festival of Birds. This excursion is included in the Festival of Birds. And so you probably already know about it, but if you don't, there's so much going on this month. All of our field trips are in person. All of our lectures are online. So wherever you are joining from, you can participate in our lectures and everything is recorded and you'll receive the link after the program. So you can enjoy it another time if the schedule time isn't convenient for you. So we are uh, transferring to questions now. It looks like we have a whole bunch. So I'm gonna start reading them and the field cam will join us as they can. Um, 
here's a really good question that I also was wondering. It's what is the definition of the word you used when you were referring to the guide, passerine? What does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I heard myself say it and I thought, oh, I hope somebody asks. A passerine is going to be your small songbirds that are perching birds. So anything you might see on a telephone wire is probably a passerine. Okay, great. And along the lines of that, I feel like your answer is going to be a passerine bird to this question. But uh, Mary Lucas wants to know which bird band sighting has been your most unusual or your favorite? All right. Well, um, my favorite bird banding experience I had was actually probably in South Carolina. But I love to talk about this one particular one here. Um, one week we were here at Rookery Bay. We actually caught a Swainson's warbler. And the Swainson's warbler is a really elusive bird that hangs out in thickets. It can be really hard to spot. And the reason I love to bring that one up is because our director here at Rookery Bay is obsessed with birds and he's never one in this county and we caught it right here in the parking lot at Rookery Bay. Oh my gosh I remember that and he was uh blasting emails doing a special dance you know yeah. It was like that a reserve was... holiday we all remember. <laughs> right that's one of my favorites. Um, and I'll just add a plug for our last activity of the Festival of Birds is going to be trivia time and I am honored to be able to co-host the trivia with said director, Keith Lockenin. So he is more than a bird fanatic. There has to be a special word for him. And we hope that you can join us for the trivia on the uh, January 31st, the last day of the month to wrap up the festival. And if you watch all of our videos and attend our programs, you'll have a wing up on the competition, let's say. Okay, let's see. Um, our next question is, there's so many. Okay, here's a good one. How do you decide where to put the mist net? It's yeah, a good question. That's actually kind of, a, it could be a bit of a trial and an error thing. But what we're aiming for is we're trying to find areas that birds are already passing through. And the reason we're doing that is here, what we're trying to do is learn about the birds that are moving through this area. So we're not trying to attract the birds to our nets we're trying to put the nets where the birds already are. So we're looking for these corridors. Um, a couple other things we have to keep in mind are the nets become a lot more visible when it gets windy or when it's sunny. So we want a place where the wind is blocked, the sun isn't uh, directly on them. And we also need to find a place where the predators can't see them. Because when these birds get caught in the nets, they're vulnerable. So if a predator gets there before I do, we could lose a bird. So we need to make sure that it's in a spot where no hawks are watching. Great, um, there are so many really good questions. So I'm just gonna breeze through them. And if we wanna go back and, and talk more, just stop me. Um, there's a person out there named Tegan who wants to know what birds have been caught at Rookery Bay? Ooh, that's a great question. So our number one bird that we have caught is the gray catbird. Um, we get a bunch of those guys moving through and there are days where it's just like, oh, another catbird, another catbird. But those are a migratory species. So getting that information is actually really cool. And some of the catbirds are, have been picked up on our modus tower. So somebody up north is actually doing a study on catbirds and our catbirds moving through here are actually contributing to that study. But um, yeah, we've got several species of warblers. We actually did catch a, uh, a hawk in the net one day. We couldn't band it because we didn't have the size that goes on that bird. So he just had to release, but that was pretty cool too. Have you ever caught a bird uh, or been uh, with other banders um, as you're gaining your skills where they caught a banded bird? Oh yeah, yeah. and. That's probably the most exciting thing for a bird bander 
in it, it, it makes our day. Um, because there are so many birds out there. The times that you actually catch a bird that are banded by somebody else are very few and far between. So when you do, you can go back to that bander and say, hey, I caught your bird. And you can learn all sorts of information about how that bird and that species are moving through the area. That's exciting. That is really cool. Um, actually, that was a question that someone had submitted too. So thanks for answering. Um, I wanna go back to the fact that you said we probably didn't catch any birds right now because of the time of day. What is it about the morning that means that you're likely to catch more birds? Yeah, so birds, they store fat and they lose it very quickly. They have to keep eating in order to gain that fat and that muscle that they need. And when it gets cold at night and when they can't eat because they're sleeping, they start losing their fat and that's not what they want. They want to gain that fat instead. So as soon as they wake up, they have to go find food. That means that they're really active right away in the morning. They're looking for that breakfast. <laughs> That's cool. I I share that sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we have a, another question. It's actually kind of a two part question. Um, the first part is, what is your favorite bird that you've banded? Oh no. Um, <laughs> I. So I used to work up in Maine and I would band these kind of large football sized birds called razor bills. And they take a very special triangular band. And I found that to be a really fun experience. They bite really hard though. So <laughs> you kind of have to be uh, careful with them because they'll bite and they'll twist and it, uh, it hurts. But if you, get those bands on it's um it's cool hmm. triangular yeah um, they're like oh. it, that's really cool i've never heard of a triangular band um and along those same lines it might be the same story that you choose to share what is the most challenging bird that you've ever banded okay weirdly um chickadees are probably the most challenging bird because they get into that net and immediately spin around and get really, really tangled up in there. Aww. So it gets really hard to take them out. And then they bite really hard. So even though they're very small, they go right for your cuticle and they bite and they're just Ooh, ferocious. Don't get your nails done. Yeah, don't get your nails done. We don't really have them here, uh, which honestly I'm kind of like thankful for a little bit. But yeah, those are probably the most challenging, even though up north they are very common. Even back here behind the camera, Shell is shaking her head. Yes, Paul, <laughs> that is true. Yeah, wow. oh, it's a hilarious. pretty typical answer for that. Oh, that's so funny. So on Saturday, we keep saying that there's going to be the bird in hand demo in the parking lot at Rookery Bay. Now, if you have a festival pass, you also get free admission to the Environmental Learning Center. If you don't have your festival pass yet, you can go right to rookerybay.org and buy one. That gives you admission to so many lectures and programs this month and access to the ones that have already taken place because we do have them recorded. And not only do you get free admission all month long to the Environmental Learning Center, but you get a 15% off discount on our exclusive eco tour partner as well, Rising Tide Explorers. And they offer guided boat and kayak tours as well as rentals. So you really can experience our whole month of um, bird related activities within the reserve. So we hope that you'll join us for future events. Cole, what should people expect for this banding demo on Saturday? I mean, are they, do they need any kind of skills? How do you know you're gonna catch something and where will you be located? Where can they find you? Yeah, we will be located out front of the learning center. Um, you don't need anything. It's always good to bring your binoculars so you can look if you have them, but you don't need to. Um, we can't promise that we're going to catch anything, but today we have three nets out. That day we should have somewhere close to 10. So we've wow. increased our odds of catching something and we're putting them throughout the parking lot area, not actually in the parking lot. So don't worry about driving into one. <laughs> 
but they will be in the tree areas and hopefully that will help us catch some birds. Cool. And I'm going to put Cole in the spotlight one more time. We have a Festival of Birds featured lecture featuring Cole tomorrow on the topic of bird tracking. So we hope that you'll join us for that. What kinds of things might you be talking about, Cole? Yeah, so for that talk, I'm going to be talking about how people have been tracking birds since the beginning of recorded time up until now with all the technology that we're getting and how people can get involved with that and how you can see the ways scientists are tracking these birds. Um, it has changed a lot. We've learned a lot. We used to think new things that we find out now are wildly untrue. So uh, <laughs> kind of what that talks about. Cool. Ooh. And if you can't join tomorrow at two o'clock on Zoom, like I mentioned, um, you will get the recording if you are a festival pass holder. So that being said, I think it's almost time for us to wrap up. I do want to mention that there are, as I have several times, so many festival activities. So we're gonna drop the link in the chat box for everyone to be able to click on and register. And um, I wanna highlight our keynote speaker in case you're not aware. So gonna... our presentation is called Birding Coast to Coast, The Life say... of a Big Year Birder. The winds are picking up out here. So we're gonna- Okay, go ahead and take bye. down the net. Thank you guys for joining. Bye. Everyone Great. says bye. Great. Um, so we hope that you'll join us for our keynote presentation as well. And that will actually be in the evening also on Zoom. And the date of that is January 27th. So we hope to see you at a future event soon, including trivia time on January 31st. Thanks so much for joining us today. Signing off. Bye-bye.